Recently, I've been spending a lot of time watching dead mall videos here on YouTube. Shout out to Retail Archaeology. Then I thought, you know what game really gives off dead mall vibes? Namco Museum. Not Namco Museum on the Switch or on the 360 or on the PS2 or any of the other frauds, hack frauds, which share the title Namco Museum. I'm talking about the OG Namco Museums Volume 1 through 5 on the PlayStation. The idea was that you're actually going to a museum, like a physical museum, where each of these games would be its own exhibit. You're the only one who's ever in the museum. And and the music, these early PlayStation 1, just empty, low-poly visuals. They give off the same feeling, I guess, as being in a dead mall. As a kid, I had volumes 1 and 3, and it seems like those are the only ones that people actually bought. And I always wondered, what about volume 2? What's in volume 2? Then later on, I learned about 4 and 5, and even later than that, about 6, which was only released in Japan. Each cover had a different letter, with 1 having N, 3 having an M, which I didn't really know what that meant as a kid, but when you put them all together, it spells Namco, N-A-M-C-O. It's five volumes. But I could never find volumes two, four, or five around. Whenever we would go to EB Games, I would always look, but they only ever had one and three. Of course, now, in the age of getting whatever the hell you want, whenever the hell you want, I, uh, well, I still only own one and three, because they're... The other volumes are way too damn expensive, but, you know, you can still play whatever you want these days. This is just going to be a chill walk around, a chill walk through, if you will. Me sharing with you what truly is the holy grail of retro video game compilations. Way back in 1995 when Namco was releasing these, I guess just the idea of going back and visiting old video games was a kitsch enough idea. They really felt the need that they had to go all out. Like, the games couldn't prop the package up by themselves. I'm gonna give each game one play. Each game in all these collections has tons of options. You can flip individually all the dip switches, but I'm going to be playing everything with its default settings. Every volume started with this FMV cutscene with 3D models representing characters in each of the games. Volume 1 here is, is admittedly kind of lame. It's Pac-Man running from some ghosts, only the ghosts uh, pass him instead of doing whatever it is they're doing in Pac-Man. Then all the other characters pass him by, you see the spaceship from Bosconian in the background, the Galaga ship going by, the Toy Pop people, leaving Pac-Man down in the dumps. But never fear, Miss Pac is here. You begin in this lobby area. The controls are real simple. All you can do is run and look up. Which is, believe it or not, one of my main complaints with Namco Museum. Because it's either all or nothing when you're looking up. You hold the button down and Pac-Man, I guess, or you start to look up. But then as soon as you release it, your head goes back down to eye level. So either you're looking all the way up or you're looking straight ahead, and there's no good way to settle the camera in between. I know, I know, it's an incredibly minor complaint, but I wish there were more modern camera controls in these games. Volume 1 being a 1995 PlayStation release has no analog controller support. In fact, none of the volumes do, which is understandable because 5 out of 6 of them were released before the honkin' thing existed. Words can't express how much I love the aesthetic of these super early PlayStation, early 3D environments. And if you love them too, the Namco Museum is something you definitely have to check out. The receptionist allows you to put in your initials so you can save your scores. The museum proper is one central octagonal room, with rooms leading to each individual exhibit. You see these big signs with artwork representing each game. Let's hit up the lounge first. Here in this office break room, you can view a complete list of every game that Namco has ever made. A feature which every other volume would also include, as well as scans for the NG, or Namco Gamer I guess, magazine's front covers. They were really proud of this magazine, because every other volume would continue this tradition as well, and include cover scans of later issues. Namco Museum is a celebration of Namco's history. Like, look at how cool this is. You can zoom in to examine these magazines in more detail, you just don't see bonus materials like this anymore. Most scanned materials are in Japanese, because Namco is a Japanese company, and you can just tell from the game selection that the Namco Museum PlayStation line was intended for Japan first and foremost. 
The biggest hint possibly being that the sixth volume never even came out over here. What the hell is the Namco robot? It's weird stuff like this that makes Namco Museum so special. It really does feel like they left no stone unturned at Namco HQ when searching for things to include. Like they ransacked those offices just looking for any relic they could scan. And it warms my heart to see. There's a cute little mini bar to sell this aesthetic. A jukebox where you can actually listen to the music and sound effects from each game. But those aren't all the bonus features. First, let's check out Toy Pop, the most obscure and strangest inclusion by far. I'm not going to cover every museum room because they all look more or less the same, with the only difference being the color of the checkerboard on the floor and wall stripes. And obviously, the things on display. Here in this hallway, you can view promotional material, instructional cards, any art which may have been produced for whatever game you selected, even scans of the original arcade boards. It really is incredible and commendable the lengths they went the amount of stuff that they give you on each of these games and this is just for little old toy pop every game no matter how small was given the same treatment and i love that oh look at this you can even view each sprite individually and after all that at the end of what was already way too much is a pure white void with an arcade cabinet okay this was possibly a terrible example to start on because out of all the games and all the collections this is the one that they phoned in the most it's just a pure white void with almost nothing but at the end of these hallways normally you're taken to a fully rendered 3d representation of the game you're about to play but again, for whatever reason, they got really lazy with Toy Pop. Every other game and every other volume has some incredibly aesthetic visual, which I suppose this white void could be considered too, I guess. Well, anyway, Toy Pop is from 1986 and was designed by Takefumi Hayoto. It's a single screen shooter that can be played by two players simultaneously which is likely why it was included. Your objective is to collect all the yellow hearts, which for some reason forced this door to open over here. There are a variety of enemy and weapon types, and each enemy can only be defeated by one specific weapon, like cars are only defeated by the final records, tanks by bombs, and bubbles by arrows. There's not a button to switch weapons or anything, so you need to blast open these presents hoping that the correct one happens to be there. Its music can be a little bit irritating, but overall I like this one. Almost reminds me of a more cooperative Bomberman. Next up is Bosconian, and wow, take a look at this place. This is certainly a vibe. The room we're in is more like what you can expect out of these screens. Bosconian is from 1981 and designed by Makoto Sato, who unbelievably apparently still worked at Namco as recently as 2019, and were credited as a graphic designer on Sekiro Shadows Die Twice in the Dark Souls series of all places. It's a multi-directional shooter, notable for its use of voice synthesis. Locked I remember having a lot of fun with this one as a kid, but revisiting it now, it's a little slower than I remember. And I keep expecting Sinistar to pop up, but no, that's a different arcade compilation I'm thinking of. Your objective is to destroy the giant green Bosconians, I'm assuming is what they're called, which is either done by shooting each pod or by one perfectly placed Death Star shot up the middle. Bosconian is kind of a hidden gem. Unfortunately, the success of Galaga, which Namco also released in 1981, cannibalized most of this game's market. Namco actually sold out of Galaga machines and resorted to converting their stock of Bosconians to that more popular game. As a result, physical Bosconian arcade cabinets are exceedingly rare, which is a shame because this is much better than, I don't know, 90% of all games that are over 40 years old. Bosconian gets a huge thumbs up. Wonderful inclusion. Next we have Rally X, and Tim Rogers actually had a really great segment about Rally X in his Pac-Man video. The TLDW being that this game and Pac-Man came out around the same time, that they're both similar, and despite or perhaps because Rally X was more grounded in reality, i.e. you're obviously controlling a Formula One car here, and Pac-Man is entirely abstract, that Rally X faded away while Pac-Man soared to unbelievable heights. Which goes against conventional wisdom, you would think it would be easy 
easier to sell a game where you're playing as a car or a vehicle than whatever undefinable stuff is going on in Pac-Man. It was released in 1980 and designed by Hirohito Ito, and Rally X is the only game I could find credited to the guy, so he must not have stayed in the industry long. The game itself is a lot like Pac-Man. You automatically move, you're in a maze being chased by these red vehicles, but the maze itself is too zoomed in, and I find myself playing off the mini-map on the side more often. You can also blow smoke out of your exhaust pipe, causing the red cars to spin out. Rally X is okay. It's gotta be my pick for worst on volume one. But this disc is a stacked lineup, and it's by no means bad. For a game from 1980, the fact that I could have any fun at all with it is a testament. Pole Position from 1982 has three credited designers. Oh, look at the cute little Namco blimp. The crowd looks like crap, though. It's just a bunch of colored squares. Pole Position as a game really shows how far the car game, the Formula One game, the racing game had come in just a couple of years. It must have been crazy to see something like this all the way back in 1982. So like stack this game side by side with Rally X and holy shit. Pole Position was highly influential as you can see with Square's Rad Racer, Nintendo's F1 Race and Mock Rider, Sega's Outrun, and countless other 80s racing games aping its style. Well here's Pole Position. It was the originator of all those games. The actual cabinet was enclosed and featured a racing wheel, as you can tell by its lovingly constructed model in the museum. Honestly, I don't think Pole Position is particularly fun to play today. I have a hell of a hard time attempting to stay on the track. But you have to pay respects to what Pole Position means to video games as an art form. Oh my lord, this room is batshit insane. I don't know if this is what I think of when I hear Galaga, but it's cool nonetheless. Now's a perfect time to mention that many of these games support what Namco Museum calls arcade mode. Many early 80s arcade games used vertical monitors instead of the typical horizontal orientation you'd find on a standard TV. As a result, when playing some of these games on Namco Museum, certain alterations had to be made to fit the entire game on screen at once. For example, Galaga in the arcade doesn't have this side panel. The score was kept up top. Namco Museum offers to display the game in its original orientation. The only catch is you have to turn your TV sideways. Anyway, Galaga is one of the most well-known games of all time, and you probably don't need me to tell you it's fun. This was the perfection of the Space Invaders-styled shooter. The complex for its time enemy patterns, the way they fly in to start instead of just appearing like in every other game, how nuanced Galaga's power-up system is. You risk one of your extra lives for added firepower, and in turn become double the target. The risk-reward weighing of shooting the Galagas as soon as possible, or waiting till when they come down with reinforcements so you can get more points. Holy shit, this game is some genius level stuff. The best game on volume one, perhaps the best game in any of the volumes. It's fucking Galaga. <laughs> To my absolute delight, Pac-Man's house is modeled after its appearance in Pac-Man 2, The New Adventures, which only would have been a year old at the time. The game itself is a little scrunched. Unless, of course, you play it sideways. And it has this border art filling up the side space. I like it, but I can see how other people might not. Every time I play Pac-Man, I'm always better at it in my head than I am actually putting thumb to D-pad or thumb to joystick or however I'm playing the game. My one play score was embarrassingly only 18,130, which is an okay score, and I guess I'm happy with it, but I don't know. It seems like whenever I think about this game, I'm always a lock to get at least three ghosts with one power pellet, if not all four. But here, I was struggling to get more than two. Maybe it's rust, maybe I'm just not as good as Pac-Man as I thought. 
And what can I add about Pac-Man? It's iconic. In whatever Namco collection you put together, if you're going to have a Namco museum game and not have Pac-Man, then like, what's the point? So they did the right thing. You absolutely had to have Pac-Man and here it is. A mere two months after the first volume saw the release of Namco Museum Volume 2 with a more energetic FMV intro sequence. Pac-Man's blasting off to the Space Museum. Let me just say right off the bat that it's wonderful finally getting to discover what Volume 2 was all these years later. Seeing this intro, it's like a piece of my nine-year-old self can finally be put to rest. It's finally complete. Two's loading screens feature Mappy the Mouse. One said Pac-Man, I guess I'll mention those from now on. And Two's museum portion is a direct copy and paste of One's. I knew going in that Three had a completely different museum from One, so finally getting to see Volume Two and learning that it's just One with different games and different materials plugged in was a big disappointment. I expected all five games to have new museums, new connecting environments, or at least new textures. Looking at the list of games included, you can see why 2 wallowed in more obscurity. It's a bunch of no-names with Super Pac-Man and maybe Mappy slapped on. And at least to me, Mappy's not much of a selling point. First game we're gonna look at in Volume 2 is Grobda. And we're in some kind of coastal shipping yard? Not really sure I understand what they're going for here. Alright, let's uh... Oh, oh fuck! Oh. oh man, um... I didn't stand a chance. Wow. Grobda is a descendant of one of those old Atari tank games, most famously included as a game mode in the 2600 pack in combat, but it existed before that. And Grobda is kind of hilariously difficult. Too bad I'm limiting myself to one play each because I game overed in seconds. It's from 1984 and was designed by Masanobu Endo, who created the much more famous games Xevious and The Tower of Juraga. Xevious, which is also on this collection, we'll get to that soon. Robda seemed like fun, but it ate my quarter in less than a minute. So, goddamn Namco. Gapless is the much lesser known sequel to Galaga, and I love this visual. It's like you're trapped in the enemy's theft beams. They also used a sit-down machine instead of the more standard stand-up cabinet to get across the visual better, as a full stand-up cab in this shot would be blocking the ship. For Gapless, all I can really say is that there comes a point where more doesn't necessarily equal better. Gapless is Galaga, only with a bunch of shit added and lopped on that doesn't really make the game more fun. I wasn't good enough to show you, but you can have up to a four shot instead of two like in Galaga. I mean, that sounds more fun, but at that point you're taking up half the screen. And I don't know, it just, it, it feels like it kind of cheapens the idea. The graphics use slightly more detailed sprites, yet are somehow less timeless as a result. I mean, these are more identifiably insects, but so what? They don't look as good if you ask me. You can move halfway up the screen now, which also I have to ask why. It doesn't fit this style of shooter very well. Don't get me wrong, Gapless is still a lot of fun and worth being on the collection for sure, but at the end of the day, it just made me want to play Galaga instead. Oh my god, this is some PS1 majesty. Look at this endlessly repeating texture on the wall. What are these glowing orbs? What am I looking at? What game do you think this is? Just judging by the room, I would have no idea. Well, I already mentioned it. It's Xevious. And Xevious was a much bigger deal in Japan than it was here. It's a vertical scrolling shooter, but what made it stand out are that there are two different layers to shoot at. There's a ground level and an air level, I guess. In the air, it's a typical shooter, but then there's also turrets shooting at you from the ground that you have a separate fire button to take care of. This is from 83, a year before Gapless, but Xevious uses its progressive energy in much better ways. Being able to go up and down fits the scrolling shooter genre more than it does the single screen, and the dual layered concept was a genius level idea at the time. Xevious is a fantastic game and is probably as good as any of the other Namco classics, but I reckon at least in America, this didn't help sell a single copy of volume two though. 
Mappy is from 1983 and stars a cute little cartoon police mouse. He's a great character, a great design for a character, and his area looks like Resident Evil for some reason. It's a shame that I hate the game he's from. I guess it was influential. For example, I took a look at Jalico's catalog a few videos ago, and City Connection was an obvious ripoff. You also have things like Sega's Flicky, as well as a whole host of other games that I can't name off the top of my head. But I don't know, I've never found this style of game fun. The whole side view moving between layers, just concept. I don't think I've ever enjoyed a single game that did this. You're jumping on trampolines, using them to access the different layers of this house. You're supposed to collect these knickknacks while these smaller kittens chase you. So again, it's like the classic Pac-Man maze concept. You run around a little maze and enemies chase you. Your object is to get all the objects before they get you or else you die. Mappy still deserves to be here. It's an important part of Namco's history. I'm just personally not a fan. If I had this as a kid, maybe I would be a big Mappy fan. Who knows? Maybe if I had volumes one and two instead of one and three, I would be telling you about how great Mappy is. But as it is, eh. <laughs> Dragon Buster is a game that I had never heard of before, and it wins the award for Laziest Room in Volume 2. It's just a cube with an ugly texture plastered on the wall. Dragon Buster was released in December of 1984, and I actually had quite a bit of fun playing this. It's kind of completely absurd. I mean, just listen to this music. Compared to most of the other games we've looked at, Dragon Buster represents quite a bit of a step up in ambition. There's a world map with branching paths, as well as multiple routes within those paths. Simply having a health bar is a little forward thinking for this time as well. It's a side-scrolling action game, not unlike what Zelda 2 would eventually be. You have two attacks, a limited fireball, and a sword swipe. And as a pre-Mario side-scroller, this is incredibly impressive. The jump is a little floaty, but this is before anybody really knew how to do a jump in a video game. Yeah, Dragon Buster is a lot of fun. Another fantastic addition, but much like Xevious, I highly doubt it moved the needle in terms of sales. Nobody went out and bought Volume 2 because Dragon Buster was on here. Finally, we come to Volume 2's main event. Super Pac-Man's room is some sort of ghost nightclub. It's really cool. Look at this ghost, he's drunk as shit. Does this take place inside Pac-Man's penalty box? You can go inside the penalty box in Super Pac-Man. I wonder if uh, it's a little ref. Infamously, Namco never really figured out how to sequelize the original Pac-Man. They made all sorts of iterations, which have mostly been lost to time. Ironically, Miss Pac-Man, the only game to actually catch on, wasn't even made by Namco. Super was the most successful Namco follow-up, but success here is relative, and it's still regarded in history as an overall failure. I think what Super gets the most wrong is how non-transparent its rules are. With Pac-Man, you can get the gist of it by just watching five seconds of gameplay. Your goal is to eat all of the dots, you're being chased by these ghosts, don't let them get you or you die. Then if you eat the bigger dot, you can eat the ghosts, and that's it, that's the whole game. Look at this footage of Super Pac-Man. What? What the hell is going on? It needlessly overcomplicates the pack concept. He doesn't need to grow twice in size, and Pac-Man shouldn't be going around collecting keys to unlock doors. Pac-Man feels bizarre with all this empty space. Why are there dead ends leading to nowhere? That just feels like bad maze design. Believe it or not, Super Pac-Man wasn't even in the Japanese Volume 2, being replaced by Cutie Q instead. And Super Pac-Man didn't show up in any of the other Japanese volumes either. And I think that's wrong. Super Pac-Man is still worthy of inclusion, and after you get used to it, the game is still fun. And even if it wasn't, this was the official in-house sequel to Namco's most important game. Even if it was kind of a failure, you can't tell the story of Namco. You can't tell the story of Pac-Man without mentioning Super Pac-Man. Like, we can learn from our failures as well as our mistakes, and this is far from the worst game that we're gonna see in any of these compilations. So, check out Super Pac-Man if you haven't. It's no masterpiece, but it doesn't deserve to be forgotten either. Let's take a brief diversion to touch upon QDQ. If you look at the giant list of every game Namco has ever made included in all these, you'll notice that QDQ is the fourth game on the list. 
So it's one of the pioneers. Its room, though, has to be one of the ugliest ones in all of Namco Museum. I mean, I get that it's supposed to be a representation of the playfield, but I don't know, this black void with the weird faces on the ground doesn't do it for me. The game is like a more complicated breakout. More complicated and slower breakout. I understand its inclusion for just historical significance, but playing this, especially with a PlayStation 1's D-pad, is not the greatest experience in the world. This kind of game really does need analog controls. was a dark and stormy night at Namco HQ when this evil tarantula spider thing was waving his arms around. <laughs> Pac-Man? What were you doing in there? Silly little Pac. Volume 3's intro stops to display each game's logo as it's going on, which is always a welcome feature. This one's super nostalgic for me. Namco Museum Volume 3 is probably the PlayStation 1 game I played the most as a kid. And that's out of all PS1 games, not just the Namco Museums. Its entire museum mode is etched into my memory for life. Loading screens feature the kid from the Tower of Druaga. Look at this cute little intro card. No smoking in the museum. Feel free to take pictures, though. Three's museum was completely redesigned from scratch. There's no more entry foyer, which, in hindsight, was sort of a pointless area. It could have easily just started with you in the big octagon. As proven here, because the information deck and the game selection doors are all consolidated into one room. Replacing the former entryway is this scrupulent new hallway. Incredibly classy. I think this is supposed to be a dragon from Dig Dug? Let's go check out the library first. Everything you would have found in the lounge in the first two volumes has been moved to the library. And wow, this is a huge upgrade. Much larger space, more delicious low poly models to enjoy. You can even see each individual magazine scan hanging on the wall. There are all sorts of other goodies to view here as well, such as the Tower of Juraga comics. On the opposing end of that scrupulent hallway, is the theater. And this place is great. Just an excuse for Namco to stick in as many 3D models of their classic characters as they could. We've got the entire Pack family, Mappy the Mouse, the Pale from Pack and Pale, the guy from Metro Cross, the guys from Toy Pop, the basketballs from Dig Dug, as well as a host of others down there by the screen. The hallways leading up to our games also got a facelift. No longer are they cut and paste, dry white, museum-esque corridors, which have their own unique aesthetic that I like. But now each game has its own custom hallways in addition to just having that one room at the end. And here's Pole Position 2's hallway. Pretty cool. And the room itself doesn't disappoint either. I still prefer Pole Position 1's, but the racing model gesturing to the screen was a fantastic touch. Pole Position 2 is almost the exact same game as the first, except I find it much harder to control. I don't know if we can talk that up to the PlayStation's controller, or if it's just overall a much more slippery game. It seems to be nearly the same, except you can see stuff like the Golden Gate Bridge back there, and this city if I freeze frame. And that seems to be 2's main upgrade. It just has more background details. Which is fine, it also has more courses to choose from at the beginning as well. So yeah, this is basically just Pole Position 1, but with a little bit more. The next one, Fozon, the strangest and most certainly least talked about pick for Volume 3 for sure. I've never heard it referenced outside the context of this specific collection. It never even gets included on newer Namco museums, it's basically just in this Volume 3. Its area is like you're a test subject in some scientist's lab. See? See up there? There he is. There's floating molecules putzing around, and this weird holographic display board rotating around the room. I like it. And I've always kind of liked the idea of Fozon more than I've liked the game itself. I've always thought it was too hard. You're supposed to try and match the shape displayed in the middle by catching these floating particles, but after a few stages, this game becomes almost impossible. It's really hard to catch these where you want them, especially when you're trying to fill up the middle spaces. I've always kind of wanted to see how crazy these shapes eventually become, but because I'm only playing these games one time each, today was not that day. Oh yeah, here's another new addition to 3. Instead of that menu with the dip switches, they changed the UI to make it easier on dum-dums like me. 
You don't even need to leave the game anymore. The menu just pops up right here. You've got all the options you had before, just organized in a more user-friendly, coherent package. The Tower of Jiraga's hallway is dark and dingy with pure black floors and Mario brick siding. In its room is one of the most impressive. The titular tower stretching high into the sky. This big ass bug thing. There's actually a hidden room you can access by holding L and R, then pressing up, down, right, left in that order three times, where you can watch the protagonist and this bug guy fight. The Tower of Juraga is in a tough spot of your Namco. The game was an enormous deal in Japan, a huge smash hit. It was one of the main inspirations behind The Legend of Zelda, for example. But if you plopped this game in front of a random somebody today, or even back in 1996 when Volume 3 was released, it's hard to make sense of what this game was supposed to be. It's a real strange mix, obviously, as you can see. It's mostly a maze game, but it mixes in a dash of action, a pinch of RPG elements, and that's what really made this game take off. This was one of the first games that was more about solving it than it was moving correctly or just shooting things to move on to the next stage. The hook is that there are secret items in each stage that you absolutely need to find to progress at certain points. And some of these are so obtuse that no one player would ever find them by themselves. It relied kind of on a concept of shared knowledge, that one person would discover a secret and then tell his friend, and then collectively the experiences of all the people that were playing this game at the same time would eventually overcome it. But if you're just worried about getting a high score, there is a score feature and you can just find the keys, move on, maybe get the secret item if you happen to find it, and then keep moving until you die. But played that way, it's sort of incredibly not fun. It's coin-op, as in pay money to play, but it's not really made for casual play. It's a strange dichotomy. Namco themselves clearly had loads of reverence for this game. The guy you play as is the loading screen. They programmed in that extra easter egg with the fight for this game. It has the most amount of bonus materials included. Draga has this rich history and it's clearly one of Namco's favorites, but it's mostly really ducking confusing if you're not in the loop. And I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that most people in America in 1996 were not in the loop. Galaxian has this sick entryway, and its room has this whole animated sequence of the ship preparing to launch. Very cool. Galaxian is a shooter from 1979. And that's possibly all I need to say about it. Look at this, and then look at something like QDQ, which was released after this, believe it or not. And suddenly Galaxian becomes much more impressive. It's sort of just the prototype Galaga, but Galaxian is still a fun time in its own. It's a natural evolution to Space Invaders. You can only fire one shot, so you need to be real careful not to waste it. This was before Namco established their patented scoring system. It seems like no matter what the game, what genre you're playing, your score will always be around the same ranges. Anything under 10,000 is pretty bad. Between 10 and 20 is good for your first try. Anything over 20, and you've probably practiced this game a little bit. Around 100,000 is personal best range, or at least what you can hit if you've practiced the game quite a bit. And anything higher than that is a pretty good score. Namco balanced their games in a way that the scores would usually end up being around the same number from game to game. From Pac-Man to Pole Position to the Tower of Juraga, radically different games, the scoring system is still similar. There's nothing like Sega's Outrun, for example, where you play the game for 10 seconds and have a score in the millions. There's nothing with noticeably lower numbers either, with the exception of Galaxian, which has a much lower scoring system than any other Namco game, at least any other Namco game included in these collections. Bottom line was that Galaxian is the first Namco game any anybody ever cared about, and it belongs in here 100%. 
Dig Dug could have headlined its own volume, if you ask me. This game is as big a retro icon as any other. We're on the surface of some kind of digging site? The environment isn't much to look at, but these dancing basketballs with goggles are. Seriously, what are these supposed to be? I've always wondered. Are they Kareem Abdul-Jabbar references? They're so strange. Enough that you don't even question the existence of dragons in Dig Dug. Why are these dragons underground? Anyway, Dig Dug takes the Pac-Man maze genre and subverts it. You can go anywhere. In fact, you even move at the same speed no matter what, whether or not you're on a predefined path or not. It's the enemies that need to somewhat adhere to the tunnels you create. They're slowed down by the dirt. You're not. His pump was also the birth of the internet inflation subculture. Who doesn't love Dig Dug? To this day, no Namco Museum release is complete without it. For Miss Pac-Man, they reused Pac-Man's house from Volume 1, but here you can actually go inside. Miss Pac-Man! This is one of the coolest things I have ever seen in my life. Miss Pac-Man apparently loves America? Oh wow, Mr. Pac-Man even makes an appearance on the toilet. Namco infamously no longer holds the rights to Miss Pac-Man, so it never gets re-released anymore. They never use the character anymore either. Whenever Pac-Man needs a female counterpart, they use someone named Pac-Girl or Pac-Lady or Pac-Woman or something. As for Miss Pac-Man as a game, it's the original Pac-Man, but they took the next logical steps. A, it's faster, and B, there's more than one stage. That's it. Those are the differences between Miss Pac-Man and regular Pac-Man. And if you find an arcade cabinet in the wild, there's an incredibly popular modification which makes Miss Pac-Man even faster than this, unofficially dubbed Super Miss Pac-Man. Holy shit, I'm a god. You see that? I went right through the ghost. Until, or I guess unless all this licensing stuff gets sorted out, you're not going to see Miss Pac-Man, arguably the best Pac game ever released, get re-released. They actually just put out a Pac-Man museum for modern consoles. I happen to have it on Xbox, but it doesn't feel complete without Miss Pac-Man. They got Super Pac, they got Pac and Pal, they got all these other weird packs that nobody really cares about, but no Miss. So Volume 3 on PlayStation is your chance to play this now discontinued gem. And what a way to end volume three i think objectively if we're gonna step back and declare a best volume it would have to be three there are only six games compared to the seven on each of one and two but they're all winners in their own right Fozon, and at least here in america druaga fill those weird forgotten niche spots you need to have dig dug and miss pack are as fantastic a one-two punch you could ask for and to top it all off it is the most detailed museum yet stuffed to the gills with amazing special features it would take something earth-shattering to top this, and spoilers, they won't. It's all downhill for me here. Which brings me to Volume 4. Starts with Pac-Man wearing a silly little hat where he's on a quest to procure the Volume 4 disc. All right, nice touch. But right off the bat, just by watching this intro, what the fluffernutter is any of this? Who are all of these people? And what the hell are they doing in my Namco Museum? They're really stretching deep for titles at this point. Namco must have already hit on all the well-known classics. As a company, they had their golden age in the early 80s. Let's say from the release of Pac-Man in 1980 up until the Tower of Draga in 84. With Volume 4, Namco is creeping up the timeline into the mid to late 80s, which, in hindsight, the late 80s into the early 90s, really up until the PS1, was sort of a dark age for the company. I'm not privy to any financial information, but just looking at the list of games they made those years, it's slim pickings to find anything remarkable. Remarkable. Volume 4 represents their attempts to find such gems, with two released in both 88 and 86, and one game from 84. That's right, there's only five games this time. Sort of. I mean, there's kind of a sixth, 
but not really. I'll cover it in a bit. You'll see. My first initial impression is incredibly strong because they finally fixed how looking works. That thing I complained about all the way back in volume one, how you can only look all the way up or all the way down. Well, now you can look in between. It took them four volumes, but they finally got it right. Now there's a button to look up, a button to look down, and the camera will actually stay where you place it. So rejoice, everybody. I can finally put the camera wherever I want, which is cool. But at the same time, it's disappointing that the museum layout is mostly reused from three but hey at least they changed up the colors and the textures a bit like in here remember that classy room in three this is it now what the flick am i looking at this is the ugliest thing i've ever seen in my life Going to the library first, it's not bad. I prefer the one from 3, but this one has its own vibe. You have all the characters from Libble Rabble mulling around, and they're here despite Libble Rabble not making the cut for any of these volumes. I suppose they want to do a tone by sticking them in here, and Libble Rabble not making the cut is probably for the best, because it would have been a nightmare to control with no analog sticks. We're in a penthouse library at the top of a tower, I guess, with a nice view of this cardboard cutout city. This building kind of looks like a PlayStation 5. The theater is mostly the same layout, but with new character renders and a kick-ass concert everybody's cheering for. We have the Mappy family, Toy Pop makes a return, the Metro Cross guy is down there now, sliding back and forth. Always love to see him. The first game we're going to look at is Ordine. These games are all complete unknowns to me, but this room is cool. You've got a 3D anime woman working at some kind of restaurant, it looks like, playing the game, and it's a horizontal shooter, something we, in fairness, haven't seen yet. You have two attacks, a regular forward shot, and one that arcs down and at an angle. It's fine, but this was released in 1988. Shooters had come a long way from the days of Galaga. It's just proof that Namco went from being on the cutting edge to just copying whatever trend they saw. This was well after Gradius and Life Force, and a host of other scrolling shmups, and I don't personally see anything Ordine does that's special. It's a decent little game, but wholly forgettable if you ask me. Next, I uh, went into this room, I can't really tell what the artwork is trying to say, and... It's completely pitch black. I can't interact with this thing, and it doesn't seem like there's anything to do in here, so... What gives, Namco? We'll come back here, I'll show you what's up later. Assault was the next game I tried out. I'm given a choice between playing version 1 or version 2. The internet has told me that the only difference is they patched out a game-breaking glitch in version 2. I guess kudos to them for giving me a choice. Alright, it doesn't really matter. This is a weird one, it's a tank game but it controls so strangely. Each side of the controller directs each tread on the tank individually. The D-pad moves the left tread forward and back, while the face buttons move the right one, and the shoulder buttons fire. It's incredibly annoying attempting to move anywhere, and I did not get used to it while playing. Think about what this means. Everything is the complete opposite of how your brain is hardwired to handle things. If you want to turn left, you need to move the right tread, and vice versa. In the heat of the moment, every single time, without fail, I would go in the complete opposite direction I intended to. Maybe if you play this enough to actually get used to the backwards controls, you'll actually be able to get the tank to do what you want and have fun. But for me, right now, this is a total write-off. The Return of Ishtar is the sequel to the Tower of Jiraga, and a sequel that I never hear anybody talk about. Its area has this statue pointing over here, okay, there's nothing there. Nowhere near as cool as Jiraga's giant Spider-Man. Wait a second, there's a save system in an arcade game? An ambitious concept for sure, but I can't imagine coming back to the arcade over and over again, typing in passwords to reload my save, attempting to finish this. It makes me put in a second player. All right, okay. We'll see what this is all about. Well, you move one with the D-pad and the other with the face buttons? What was Namco's obsession with attempting to get people to control two characters at the same time? Libble Rabble had that too. I have absolutely no idea what I am supposed to be doing. 
I got sick of keeping track of both of these frickers almost immediately, so I'm wandering around and everything looks exactly the same. And everything looks like a dead end too. Where am I supposed to go? There's not even a score counter in this game. Can I go down here? I guess not. How about in here? Surely, right? No? Do I need both characters? F that, I'm out of here. <sighs> okay, well, that's two out of five complete duds here. I have no clue what the name of this game is. What is this supposed to say? I can't read the game's title, but it has an aesthetic as hell room. Old Japanese architecture. It looks straight out of LSD Dream Emulator. So I start the game and this is what I see? None of the buttons do anything and I'm trapped. What's going on here? Apparently this one doesn't emulate well, so I have no way of playing it. But that's not going to stop me from judging it based on this footage I found on YouTube. And it actually looks kind of fun if a little hectic. Looks like you just keep walking right, slashing at Japanese demons. There's decent variety too with these top-down stages. Even though I didn't get to play it, I'm going to say this anyway. Whatever the hell this game is supposed to be called is without a doubt the best game on volume four. And I'm willing to bet my life on that. Now before moving on to the volume four main event, how about I show you what the deal with that dark room was? Think about this for a second. They lifted the same museum layout from 3. Only problem is that there were 6 games in Volume 3, and there's only 5 here. So they needed something to fill the extra door with. You go into the dark room and then hold L1, L2, R1, R2, triangle and up at the same time to unlock... Assault Plus. The room it's in looks like it was designed for a soccer game, not one where you control a tank. I don't know what's so plus about Assault Plus. It seems like the exact same game, only with new stages. I still can't control this stupid tank for the life of me, and I have next to no interest in building the muscle memory required to get into this. It's finally time for the Resident Pac-Man. And thank God, because this collection is desperately in need of a savior. Unfortunately for Volume 4, it's the unfortunate one that gets stuck with Pac-Land. You know, the side-scroller. The one that looks like a two-year-old drew it with crayons. Pac-Land pretty much had to be here because it was one of the first side-scrolling platformers and Miyamoto himself has said that it directly inspired Super Mario Brothers. But nobody on earth thinks that it's actually a fun game to play. But before I get into that, let's comment on its room because it's super chill. Pac and Miss Pac vibing on a beach. playing hide-and-go-seek with this purple ghost. Yeah, this place is awesome. Then the ghost starts chasing this fairy around and... Pac-Man is looking for a power pellet? Oh shoot, I guess we gotta help him out. So I knocked this one out of a tree for him and I think the game glitched because the power pellet is nowhere to be seen. It disappeared and... Pac-Man isn't doing anything. I'm pretty sure that was the solution to the puzzle, but nothing's happening. Oh well. As for Pac-Land, despite what I just said, I don't hate it entirely, but every time I play it, I always get to this one part with the springboard and have absolutely no idea what to do. I've never gotten past this because I can't get Pac-Man to cooperate. It seems like whatever I do, I can't get him to jump far enough to get over this pool. It just doesn't happen. Either he'll do this weak little normal jump or I'll hit the thing too late and he'll just run directly into the water. Also, just by looking at this footage, how would you imagine Pac-Man controls? Like any other game, right? You press right to go right and you press left to go left. Well, no, that would be too simple. Pac-Land controls by having you hold circle to go forward, hold triangle to go back, and then every direction on the D-pad jumps. I mean, I guess it's an adaptation of the arcade's controls in which it just had buttons, like one to move forward and back and jump, but it's just so bizarre. And it's understandable why nobody bought Volume 4 when it came out. This is such a terrible, 
value proposition. Right off the rip, you're getting one less title, which is already disappointing. And then of the ones you do get, there's one admittedly cool looking game that I didn't even get to play. One historical curiosity in Pac-Land. One generic shooter whose name I can't even remember. And two piles of crap as far as I'm concerned. It's time for Volume 5, the last one released in America. Its intro cutscene bodes about as well as 4's did. A bunch of random characters that only specific Namco employees who worked on these specific games could possibly care about. If their first pass at the mid to late 80s dredged up almost nothing worth playing, then I can't imagine what the scraps of those scraps looks like. But to my pleasant surprise, as a total package, I'm much higher on 5 than 4. Before I even touch a game, look at this museum. Oh my god, this is clucking bonkers. I began this project comparing the museum to a dead mall, which became less true with its redesign in 3, and now here, it's like you're in Pee Wee's Playhouse. Look at all the colors. Look at the, the pack train going up above me. Even its layout is much less boring. Every other volume had one central room where all the game's areas sort of branched off from. Here, they're spread all over the place. There's a game in the basement, Here's an elevator in this glass tunnel that I didn't even notice at first that leads to all the bonus materials. It almost gets full marks, but each game has its logo and some artwork on its door, while for some reason The Legend of Valkyrie just has white text on a black background. Do they have some kind of technical issue with a wrong size texture that wouldn't cooperate? That they didn't have time to fix or anything? The library is underwhelming too. They were kind of running out of bonus features to squeeze in here and you can tell. There's a cute little wind up mouse chasing another cute little wind up mappy around. The theater is cool. No more Namco cameos, but we're treated to Pack and Miss Pack performing some rendition of that famous scene from Romeo and Juliet. None of the themed rooms disappoint either. This is the best presented Namco Museum without a doubt. But do the games live up to this excellent presentation? Only one way to find out. First title is Baraduke. This is the game hidden in the basement, and it feels like a basement too. An unfinished one. Anyone else grow up in an old ass house? I'm talking like over a hundred years old, with a dirt floor, disgusting basement. Ours didn't even have a door going to it. There was a hole in the floor with some plywood over it, and a ladder leading down there. That's the headspace this room puts me in. Baraduke is a shooter, but it's one where you're trapped in a room and it has gravity. Instead of floating in midair like a normal shooter, you're a guy in a spacesuit and you slowly float downward. Your objective is to hunt down all of the enemies in one room before you're allowed to move on, and I actually think this one's a lot of fun, at least for the single credit I played of it. This would have been the best game in Volume 4 anyway. Next is Metrocross. I've mentioned that this character cameos in the last couple of volumes, and I actually already knew what this game was because you ever watch Brutal Moose? Recognize this song? Yeah, he used to use this all the time. At some point, I researched where this song came from, and it led me to Metro Cross. Its room, a little dark and ugly for my liking, has more interactable elements than you normally see. You can get flattened by this can, bounce off the trampoline. And Metro Cross, the game, was way ahead of its time. It's an endless runner, like the ones you'd see in mobile games 30 years later. You can move up and down and jump, 
and they get a lot of mileage out of those actions. You have to avoid rolling soda cans, jump over the hurdles, the green tiles slow you down, so you need to avoid those. There are also jumps, which if landed on, spring you forward, and a skateboard, which makes you move way faster. Importantly, you don't die when you run into an obstacle. Instead, every stage is on a timer, and your main obstacle is just to get to the end before time runs out. Getting crushed by the cans, or messing up, just results in you losing a little bit of time. This is kind of like the original Pepsi Man. Namco really missed out. They could have gotten on an RC Cola license or something. I adore Metro Cross, and I wholeheartedly believe that this would be considered one of Namco's defining classics if it were released more often. As it was only re-released here in the worst selling volume of Namco Museum, and again on the Xbox 360 store, but that's it. It wouldn't be in any of the more modern Namco Museums, and it's not even an issue of age like this game is too new or something. It's from 1985. I don't understand why Namco doesn't bring this out more often. Metro Cross is a winner. I don't care what anyone says. Our third game out of five is The Legend of Valkyrie. Despite the missing door art, its room is okay. You have these green slime, like from Dragon Quest, only with full human bodies chilling in the corner, and a sleepy woman resting on a small ledge. The game, though, is absolutely friggin' insane. It's another shooter, but like Baraduke, you're not in a spaceship, you're on foot. It's a foot shooter. You can jump around the screen, its sprites are huge and varied, it feels fun shooting, things you have a huge variety of weapons there's also a money and store system where you can buy upgrades and armor and just all sorts of stuff there's also some light platforming which i'm not a fan of but as a change of pace it's okay Holy cow, Volume 5. You're starting to low-key kind of kick ass. The Legend of Valkyrie is, without a doubt, another hidden gem. Dragon Spirit, our fourth game, is... Wait, this is Dragon Spirit? A dancing couple? Then they're kissing? This is the room? Where are the dragons? It reminds me of that terrible NES Dungeons & Dragons game. Or maybe King's Knight. It's a little better than that, but our three-game win streak comes to an end here because Dragon Spirit just feels like another generic shooter to add onto the pile. I can't find anything wrong with it, but I can't find anything right with it either. Which brings us to... Pac-Mania! We're in some kind of ski lodge? Not sure I understand the relevance to the game, but kinda cool, I guess. You can eat this power pellet and all the ghosts run away, except for the purple one. Also, you gotta love yet another Pac-Man 2 reference. Pac-Mania, however, is perhaps my least favorite Pac-Man game of all time. For starters, it's too zoomed in. You can't see anything that's going on. Second, its gimmick is that you can jump over the ghosts. Gee, isn't this fun? You know, subverting the only challenge of Pac-Man. He's about to get me and whoops, just jump over him. It's also way too slow. I wanted to kill off my packs just so I wouldn't have to keep on playing. It's kind of a shame that Namco felt the need to shove a Pac-Man game into every volume because Mania sucks ass. And I would much rather have seen a deeper pull. Or at the very least, they could have put a better Pac-Man game in here. Was it too soon to re-release Pac-Man 2? Maybe they could have done Junior Pac-Man or Pac-N Pal? I don't know, anything but Pac-Mania. I'm sure someone out there likes this game, but not me. I feel gross while playing it. It feels like a fake game. As for Volume 5 though, 3 out of 5 ain't bad, especially when all 3 of those receive huge thumbs up from me. I really mean it. Shout out to Metro Cross, shout out to The Legend of Valkyrie, and shout out to Baraduke for being legitimately under-discussed hidden gems in the Namco canon. Japan would get one more Namco Museum on the PlayStation called Namco Museum Encore, with the little registered trademark logo on it. 
I'll make this one quick because this one doesn't even have an actual museum. You know, the whole point of me talking about these in the first place. It's just a menu screen where you select which game you want to play, more in line with the modern Namco museums. We have seven games again, like in the first two volumes, but these feel like the scraps of scraps of scraps. What I thought volume five was going to end up being. Let's just machine gun these out. King and Balloon is a shittier version of Galaxian that came out a year later. It also talks to you. <laughs> Motos is like bumper balls from Mario Party. This one's okay, I guess. You're supposed to bump all these balls off the edge. Spy Kid is another shooter that I couldn't possibly care about. Rolling Thunder is the most famous game in Encore, and I'm dumbfounded this didn't make it into either 4 or 5, because it's better than all of the games in 4, and at least two of the ones in 5. And more so than most other games, I would have loved to have seen Rolling Thunder bonus features. Wonder Momo is one of the worst games I have ever played in my entire life. Rompers is a simple maze game from 1989, hilariously late to the maze game party. It's okay, but this type of thing belonged in 1981. You couldn't get away with releasing a simple maze game in the late 80s. Who's gonna choose to play this when you could play like Ninja Turtles or something? And finally, the last game in the Namco Museum PlayStation canon is Dragon Saber. It's the exact same game as Dragon Spirit. You play as a dragon, you shoot things, another generic shooter. My final ranking has to be 3 is better than 1, is better than 5, is better than 2, is better than 4, is better than Encore. Sure, Encore has better games than 4 and maybe even 2, but the lack of a museum mode really holds it back. So that was Namco Museum on the PlayStation. Over the years, there would be all sorts of other Namco Museums. It seems like if you could play video games on it, then it has a release of Namco Museum. But never again would they put in this much effort. Newer Namco Museums are always a solid time, but nobody has any nostalgic reverence for any of the other versions. It's exploring this area. It's all the special features. It's all of just the weird visuals and places that Namco Museum PlayStation places you in that make memories that make people get those warm and fuzzies in the deep-seated recesses of their heart. The games are there, but the personality is absent. Dead Mall origins are nowhere to be found. No kid in 20 years is going to make a tour of the Namco Museum on Switch. Interestingly enough, you can actually play the Namco Museum on Switch sideways. I can't believe they kept that feature. So that was my tour of the greatest retro video game compilation of all time. If you have any memories of playing the games on Namco Museum or just hanging out in its world, leave a comment. If you want me to look at other retro game compilations, then share the video. If it does well, if it gets more views than normal, then I have a few others I'd want to cover. But, you know, it's kind of a wait and see thing. If this video tanks, then probably not. Shout out to you if you watched till the end. Shout out to the patrons. Shout out to William Robert Lee. Anyway, that's all I got. Never trust anyone who needs a haircut. Goodbye.